Hey everyone, this is the Demolition Man from Venom Inc. and you're listening to Sonic Perspectives. Hello everyone and welcome to another interview of Sonic Perspectives. My guest today is the demolition man himself, Mr. Tony Dolan of Venom Inc. Tony, thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope everybody's well and enjoying the post-pandemic slowdown. Yes, of course. Slowly ramping up and getting more shows, more, more of everything, right? Getting back to normal. Yeah, life, life again, life. You know, we just had... You know, for every single person on the planet, you know, where just like the, the biggest pause button was put on, like we were in a movie and it just got stuck <laughs> on pause for two years. It was like, what the fuck's going on? So exactly. it's kind of nice. It's nice that's let go. And we, we're not quite fast forwarding, but we're just slowly coming back to remember what the movie was about, which is good. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about the new Venom Inc. album, There's Only Black. You see the background here. I love uh, your background. It's better than yeah. mine. I love that. <laughs> well, I don't know if you followed the reviews and the comments from the fans, but there's a lot of great feedback about it, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been amazing. You know, myself and Mantis have both commented, you know, to ourselves like, like, wow, it, it was such a great response. I mean, you know, and and you know, when you do an album, um, you 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 have to kind of just. You, you can't second guess your audience. So, you know, if you think, right, we'll try and create an album that the audience is going to like. So, you know, Metallica didn't go, let's do Master of Puppets because that'll be our most successful album. You know, Slayer didn't go, you know what, we should do Rain in Blood because everybody will love this or Ace of Spades or, you know, any, you know, famous Sabbath or Zeppelin album. They just... They made the album that they felt at the time. And, and the response is the response. People might like it. They might not like it. Some might like it. Some might not like it. I think you're always kind of guaranteed that some of your fan base is just happy that you're making music. So they're going to kind of like it. But they are going to compare it to what came before. But very much like the first album. You know, it wasn't planned. I didn't want to do an album. I just wanted to play the heritage. I wanted to play, you know, I wanted to play all of the music that we've created over the years, hence incorporated. But also yeah. I wanted to fans in places where they couldn't get to see Venom, to see a Venom, a Venom, playing yeah. songs that they didn't think they'd ever hear live, you know? Of um, course. Yeah. And, and, and that included B-sides, you know, not just them, um, you know, Black Metal Witching Hour and all that kind of stuff. But if, if they had seen Venom, they never heard them play Manitou or In the Dead of the Night or, or Lady Lust. And so for me, that was like, that was really important, which is why when we began, I wanted the fans to pick the songs they wanted to hear. I openly said, if we played, what do you want us to play? And they told us, Thousand Days in Sodom, oh, Red Light yeah. Fever. So, you know, that's why we put the set together. So initially it wasn't contrived. Uh, and when we did the first album was a tribute, was a salute to those fans across the planet who'd supported all of us individually or as a collective or as Venom or as Amcraft or just our music. So it was a way of us saying thank you so much that we'll be able to do this for you, to come and play to you and for the support you. You spent your money on tickets, on shirts, on records, and you supported us, you know, all this time. So we wanted to say thank you. Um, and I think with the new album, it was a bit different. You know, we played so many shows uh, and uh, we've, we've, we've met so many fans, old fans, new fans, young fans. <clears throat> and we just wanted to take that, uh, that communication, that energy, that, that live us and put it into a record and just let go. And so we didn't think, oh, is people going to like it or not like it? We just had to make the music that we felt and so when you do that and then you get the response where people actually connect with it 
I mean, that's what the whole thing's about. The whole thing is about the connection, you know? Yeah. Um, music yeah. is an emotional connection and the lyrics is an intellectual connection. So if you can connect on an emotional level and then on an intellectual level as well, I mean, that's that's as good as it gets. That's what the whole point is. Yeah. And I feel like there's a resurgence of metal lately, which started a few years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you find that your audience is renewed or is, you know, the old fans coming back or? I think I think it's proportionate. I think, mm -hmm. uh, of course, because, uh, you know, uh, uh, Venom has, has kept going in whatever guise it is. And Cronus continues to go out with Venom. I think the excitement of being able to see Abaddon and Mantis again, if even if it wasn't the original three, but to see them yeah. was an impetus thing. Um, and I thought for me, <clears throat> I thought, well, I don't care if I'm not him or I'm somebody else. I think the fans should be able to see these guys. So I kind of took a back seat. I did drive the car and I, um, <laughs> I was managing it and I was pushing it and getting the shores. But I would always step back when fans wanted to come and meet. So if they said, oh, could I meet Abaddon? Could I meet Mantis? I would bring them to meet them because I thought it was important for them. Um, if they wanted to meet me, that was cool. But it, that wasn't what it was about for me. It was about the music and about seeing these people. Um, and, them, and them also meeting fans um, so they could realize the impact they had, you know, on someone's life, not just... We made music and we were rock stars and we drank whiskey and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but actually, you know, to listen to someone's story go, you know, you helped me through my cancer or my parents dying or my, my dog dying or my split up with my girlfriend. I wanted them to tell the, tell hear these stories from real fans, why it means so much to them, you know, and that's why we're here, you know. So, um, yeah, so it, it's always it's always about it's always about that connection. Uh, and um, yeah, so to to then put an album out and have people, you know, responding in that way to you directly now because we have social media, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And talking about the album, after the intensity of the cover of Ave, there's a minimalistic approach on "There's Only Black." Uh, yeah. What's the backstory for that cover? Did you guys have any input for the artist, or how did that come together? Well, I put the cover together. I put all oh. the layout together. But I also did that on Arve, although I didn't do the painting uh, yeah. for Arve. But the the symbolism in Arve, it was full of symbolism. You know, it was Lucifer, mm -hmm. the snakes, the pipes, the, the foreboding background. Was it the end of the world or was it the beginning of the world? Or what was it? You know, you had the Temple of David. You had the, the, uh, uh, the fruit... Uh, the tree bearing the apple, you had Adam and Eve, you had the sheep, the wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, all the symbolism of uh, cultural, religious artifacts was there, you know, so it was more of a statement. Lucifer was the light bringer. So is he coming to say you fucked it up? Now you've got to come with me or is he coming to enlighten you? And right. and very much light is the, is the purpose of all of it. You know, the cover on this, um, you know, originally uh, I was going to call the album Nine, and it was based on Dante's Inferno's The Nine Circles of Hell. Mm -hmm. So it was going to be about your journey or my journey from birth to death and all of the stuff that happens in between because there was so much crazy stuff going on. And I, I right. wanted to take us through our lives and all those experiences because each one is individual. Yours is different to mine. Of course. And, 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 and so is someone else's. So I wanted to speak about that. We composed 24 songs because I was going to do part one, part two, wow. you know, heaven and hell in a way. And um, and then uh, so and I had the circles. I was working on the art for the cover. And then one afternoon, Mantis sent me a song and said, do you want to have a listen to this? <clears throat> so I had to listen to the music. I said, yeah, that's that's cool. I like that. So I said, uh, do you have any lyrical ideas? And he said, well, I, I already wrote lyrics. And I was like, oh, you wrote lyrics? Okay. Well, so what's it about? And he said, well, you know, when he died of his heart attack um, and they, before they brought him back, he said, you know, I looked down and I just saw this black void and, 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 and there was no light. There was no mom and dad holding out their hands. There was no my old puppy, there was none of my old friends or my aunts and uncles, there was no tunnel with light, there was no angels. All it was was black, there was only black. And I was like, wow. 
And he said, mm-hmm. so I called it, there's only black. Right. And I just thought, yeah, that's the theme. So mm-hmm. I scrapped the artwork, I scrapped, and then I just came up with this because it's symbolic of, we don't know what's in a black hole. We, we assumed that nothing escapes a black hole. Once it goes in there, it's crushed to nothing. We, we couldn't understand that, but you, 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 know, you didn't know what was in there. But very much like death, death experience, you know, we'll all die, but your experience of what happens next is going to not be the same as mine. But we yeah. can't talk about that because you, once you've done it, that's it. So you can't come back and tell me, you know, my, you know, you go to a seafood restaurant tonight. Tomorrow you tell me there's a seafood restaurant in whichever town it is. And, and it, I may go there and try it. And, and, and I'm taking on your experience and then we can talk about the experience I had. But if you die, if you go into a black hole, if you get to the end of the universe, these things are so impossible that once you do it, you can't come back and tell me. So it is just your experience. And I thought that's what I wanted to convey with this, you know, with the black right. hole, you have to come in, go into it. And then what do you discover? Your feeling, your experience. So come into the album and you may find everything there. You may find nothing there. You right. may love it. You may hate it. There may be one song that you connect to. There may be no songs you connect to, but yeah. it will be your experience. So that's that was the whole uh, premise for it. Okay. And do you think we can see, uh, you know, the double album, See the Light of Day at some point? Or are you keeping it for the future? Or No, no, no. Yeah, they're, they're, they're um, following this. We've got it lined up. So okay. I think we've decided to... Uh, now we've decided to just tweak a couple of things, but we mm-hmm. have it kind of ready to go. So that will come out next year. Okay. We want a part two out next year. Yeah. Because there was quite a gap between the two albums yeah. the, and this one, but not intentionally, purely because we were just touring. It's like, you know, we just didn't have any time. And almost like the pause, the pandemic, um, we finished... Uh, the festival season, we finished Vakin in 2019. I had to have a hip replacement. So I figured because I'm going to have like eight weeks of recovery, um, why don't I go to Portugal where Jeff lives, where Mantis mm-hmm. is, he has his studio. We can just like lounge around. I'll be getting better and doing my therapy and we can write. And so that was the idea. And then the 220, we would have the album out and then go back on tour. Of course, the yeah. pandemic stopped everything so it was like well why don't we just keep writing we don't have any pressure of touring we don't have any schedule because you couldn't print stuff like in a normal way because record print pressing plants were all closed and uh, so we just took our time and because we did that we ended up with a surplus of songs and the idea of going well why don't we pre-record two worst of albums and then we don't have to wait for another five years to release part two we can just do it whenever we want right. so that's well, that's where we are now okay and this one is the first album with uh, war machine in the band and he surely delivered what was the process oh, yeah. to bring him on board well you know he was doing our sound um mm-hmm. we we went on tour for rv we toured in america and a sound man was suggested to us which was jeremy so we took him on sound and then um you know abaddon wasn't so well and he was struggling, uh, 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 not, uh, you know, generally he was okay. He was kind of masking some issues, mm-hmm. but um, but with the live material, with the old stuff, he, you know, he's struggling, but with the new stuff, uh, you know, he was finding it very difficult and um, it became evident, you know, and uh, I was kind of trying to keep the thing together. Mantis was getting a bit pissed off because mm-hmm. uh, he, he kind of, he likes it to be, you know, in a particular way. And uh, and it wasn't happening like that. And then um, one night, Chuck Billy, who was part of the management team from Testament, uh, said to me, did you know that Jeremy plays drums? And I said, uh, oh, no. And he said, yeah, he, the absence. So he dropped a few tunes on me. I had a listen. I thought, oh, wow, he's really good. Mm-hmm. So I spoke to Jeremy. I said, listen, if something happens in Abaddon, feels he can't play would you be able to learn the songs and maybe step in for him um you know because i figured maybe there was a show that tony wouldn't be able to do or something while we were on tour 
So Jeremy Lisson went, yeah, no problem. So he learned the songs. Uh, when we came back off that tour, um, Abaddon had uh, got involved with a very young woman. Uh, they decided they were going to get married. Um, and then she got pregnant. So mm -hmm. he was going, look, we're, we're going to have a baby. So I want to be there when she has the baby, which we totally understood, of course. Uh, but then he decided he needed a month off. And we had the first half of an American tour lined up. Um, so I said, well, we've now got these dates and they paid deposits. I said, so uh, I don't know what to do. Uh, John Suzula, who was uh, you know, gone now, bless his soul, but he was our other part of our management. He was used to have Megaforce. He found Metallica. And John just said, like, well, why don't you use Jeremy? Because he knows the songs. And I thought, OK, well, you know, let's talk to Tony about that. John talked to Abaddon. Abaddon said, yeah, OK. And I said, well, you know, Jeremy will do the American dates. And then when you when Tony's ready, he just comes back and we carry on with Europe. Um, so that's what we did. Um, but Abaddon never came back. And so it was like, oh, OK. So I yeah. said to Jeremy, well, just stay on the stool until you're not on the stool anymore, thinking <laughs> at some point um, Abaddon will be back. But he never came back. So... We just kept going. And then, of course, we played so many live shows when it came to doing the new album. It was Jeremy was the drummer. So it was like, OK, well, let's just go in. So <clears throat> and <clears throat> I think his energy, his style, you know, really pushed us even further. And he's such a monster. But his finesse also, the way he thinks, you know, the way he performs, it's so natural. And, and that's what I'm all about. So, you know, his when it came to recording for the album and he said, how would you like me to kind of approach it? I just said, feel it, just feel it, you know, because right. all the best musicians, you know, you ever watched your favorite guitarist, he's got his eyes closed and he's just playing with his mouth open. It's like, well, he's not looking at what he's doing because it's not, it's not here. It's, it's here, mm -hmm. you know? So if you feel it and then it becomes real, and I think that this whole album is very real. It's very us. It's very real. You know, I've heard commentaries of going, oh, Mantis solo has gone to another level. But he plays plays from his heart now. He doesn't play from his fingers anymore. He just plays from his heart. And if that's simplified, then it's simplified. If it's complex, it's complex. But it's real. And that's the key, I think. Right. And I'm curious about your vocal approach, because you sing with your raspy voice, throughout the whole album. Um, yeah. How do you manage to do that and do like a full set of songs with that voice of yours? Because it's going to be a tough undertaking, right? Well, I'm, I'm kind of blessed, you know. I think the cigarettes and the whiskey helped. <laughs> um, I, used to be a, I used to be a tequila man, solid right. tequila, uh, until Lemmy died and then I switched to the whiskey. But right. I think that it got croakier with the whiskey like yeah. Lemmy's. Uh, but certainly the cigarettes. But I think, you know, when you age, your voice drops a tone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you get a bit deeper as well. But I, um, you know, when uh, very early on, uh, when I used to go out and tour, I uh, would struggle, you know, with the voice and trying to keep it alive. And, and touch wood, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many shows I've done in my life over 40 years, a few thousand. Um, and I'd do a 30-day run with no days off, bang, 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 every night. And, and, and only twice in my life did I lose my voice and it was caused by smoke inhalation on stage, you know, where my throat <laughs> dried out. Um, but other than that, you know, uh, my voice just keeps keeps going. I, I do uh, do singing. I did singing exercises. I was taught by an opera uh, uh, teacher, an opera mm -hmm. singing teacher, how to use my diaphragm, how to approach the voice. So I kind of now... I kind of can control it. It sounds like I'm just screaming. And I guess when you first start, you're kind of, that's what you're doing. Right. But um, I practice singing songs. So in my downtime, I will sing, um, not with a gruff voice. You know, I'll sing Peter Gabriel or what. I'll sing a lot of songs to keep my vocal cords working. And then when I have to do our stuff, I just add the little bit of vibration, which gives the growl and then, you know, it's easy. So, right. you know, I, I think, uh, yeah, we could do 60 shows in a row and I've never lost my voice. You know, wow. it's been the same every night. So, <laughs> you know, touch wood, touch wood, you know, Lucky. I guess yeah. uh, it's fortunate. Yeah. 
And uh, I hear a lot of comments about bass players that also sing, that uh, it's a great position to be in because you control the low end and the high end as well, the sound of the band. What does it feel like to be in that position for you? Do you have that perception as well? Yeah, I think so. I, you know, I've always played, I've always chosen uh, to play, other than my Rickenbacker, which was Lemmy and Juice, um, I've always chosen kind of a jazz bass mm. uh, uh, setups and jazz bass sounds because they have that high end, but I also can get the low end as well. And basically because if you're a three piece, when he goes to solo, there's an audio drop in the sound. So I can boost my signal and I can chord it and I can play a bit more. So I get to play guitar when he's playing solo and then I can go back to playing bass. But even right. during the song, I can switch back and forth, single notation, chords. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can really free myself up a lot and do runs and stuff. You know, I add a little bit of distortion, uh, a little bit of chorus, um, uh, but mostly it's kind of a dry signal. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's just that playability. And and the bow L's that I use have a very low deep end, but a very poppy uh, jazz uh, tone as well. So depending on my string setup or what, you know, how I'm EQing it, you know, I can get right across everything. Uh, yeah. and, and, and being a bass vocalist, the one thing I always used to hate was uh, the, the, the kind of guys who would constantly be looking at their fingers, you know, singing, looking, singing, looking, singing, looking, because yeah. you're not connecting to your audience. Yeah. And then um, I would watch Geddy Lee, <laughs> you know, who isn't looking at anything and he's at all fucking yeah. playing everything he's playing yeah. feet and hands and he's just singing and i think yeah. how how is he doing that <laughs> and then i read a thing where he um had used a mirror um to yeah. learn where his fingers <laughs> were so i do that all the time when i rehearse for shows before we go on tour i do it in front of a mirror so i'm i'm just looking at my my fingers and then, so when I go live, I'm actually looking at the mirror. So I can almost look into the audience right. and I can see where my fingers are. So I don't have to keep referencing all the time. <laughs> I can trust myself. And it is about trust. Um, there's only so many notes. There's only so many frets. And yeah. uh, and I've got four strings and I know where I want to go. So if you see it in your mind and you just trust yourself, you find that you'll find the patterns. So I find it really exciting. You know, as an instrument, I find it really exciting. I find being able to switch between a guitar lick and, and a bass lick. I love that. I love that. Yeah. And I think you're an accomplished actor too. Uh, you were in a movie called Master and Commander with Russell Crowe, right? What was that like? I was. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. You know, I mean, you know, I work as a technician, so I'm a, 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 an automation engineer. So mm. I used to be a master carpenter in theatre. So I'd done a lot of theatre shows as my day job. And then um, I was working for Queen on We Will Rock You, okay. uh, then stage musical. And um, um, I, I had done, I'd done a couple of theatre bits and a little bit of TV um you know just opportunities came along and i was like yeah why not so um but then um i got a call to go and do uh, a movie and i went down and saw the people and they put me in a movie and uh it was judge dread with sylvester salone and arma de sante and i was like wow this is cool <laughs> and then my agent said after that uh you know most of the stuff got cut out and edited and ended on the floor which i was like devastated about because right. i thought oh uh -huh. you know but um my agent said yeah you should do more of that so i was like okay and then i got a call to uh, for 20th century fox for this movie and they said it's a huge hollywood star so i thought well i'm i'm never gonna get this <laughs> and the director was the guy who did truman show peter weir Okay. Uh, and um, yeah, he loved me. So they put me in the movie. Um, and it was an amazing experience. Five months in Mexico. I lived in uh, Baja, uh, Rosarito, wow. um, uh, which was amazing. Um, you know, I love Mexico and Mexican food. So for me, it was perfect. The weather was perfect every day. I could watch dolphins and I had my fish tacos. I was very happy. Lots of right. tequila. Perfect. Right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, me and Russell became great friends. And uh, he's a musician too. Uh, Paul Bettany was in that, who went on to do the Marvel stuff as Vision. Yeah. Uh, he's a musician. Uh, Billy Boyd, who was in Lord of the Rings, was in the movie. He's a musician. You know, wow. Brian Dick. Yeah, so it was like, for me, it was perfect because it was like I could act during the day and then in an evening we were jamming and playing and, and uh, yeah, it was an amazing experience. 
Absolutely um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people yeah. had said to me, you know, uh, why did you stop doing or were you not successful? It's like, well, success is measured by what you do. You know, I wanted to do a movie and I did several. I wanted to do a television thing and I did several. I wanted to be on stage with the RSC, Royal Shakespeare Company, and I was, you know, so... <laughs> For me, it's I didn't say I wanted to have a house in Malibu and 50 million bucks. <laughs> um, right. So, you know, Tom Cruise is Tom Cruise. I didn't want to be Tom Cruise. But of one thing course. I did, one thing I did, uh, uh, I think I didn't pursue it more because um, I was, I spent time in the Hollywood and it's just not a real place. You know, people love you one day and don't talk to you the next day. And I just thought, you know, I'm from the north of England, so I'm kind of working class from an industry, and I kind of like people to just be normal. So I figured I didn't fit into that. I love yeah. the acting. <clears throat> I have done voice. I do a lot of voiceovers and stuff like that, you know, advertising and radio plays. But uh, but for the 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 film, the movie industry, you know, I I I uh, yeah, it's not who I am really. I, I I like being on the screen. It's great being in it, but the whole process is so you're not real. That yeah. I kind of like music more because I can I can go to a show, play a show, and straight away afterwards go and jump into the fans and talk to the fans and 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 you know touch them and listen to them and and you know take photos with them. And when you do a movie, you fly in. You do your bit, you fly out, they pay you, but that's it, you know, it's yeah. like on to the next thing. So, yeah, it wasn't for me, but great to do, uh, great fun. And I've got some wonderful acting friends from it. So uh, I'm very grateful. Fair enough. Well, back to Venom Incorporated. Uh, the latest news is that you had to cancel the North American tour, which is unfortunate. Uh, <sighs> it was supposed to start in a few days. Uh, what's the plan right now in terms of resuming touring or booking something else in Europe or... Well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of kind of fresh. I'm trying to work on that now. I mean, okay. basically, you know, when you go to America, as, as you're, if you're British, when you go to America, we have to go through a process. It takes up to six months. Mm -hmm. You have to make applications. You have to use a, 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 a immigration attorney, uh, and it can cost between two to $10,000. In this case, we're into about $5,000. Um, and then you get approved. Once you get your approval notice, you have to, in your home country, then go to the embassy. You make an appointment to have uh, an interview where you're basically going to hand you, them your passport. Mm. They look at all your paperwork. They take it away, put your visa in and send it back to you. Because of COVID, um, they said to me, you don't have to come for interview. We'll waive you. Just send your passport. We'll send it back. Not a problem. Because Mantis lives in Portugal. They said anybody in Portugal must attend an interview. Okay, we'll do the interview. Right, you cannot have an interview until November. Oh. We said, well, but we have a tour. We So we've been trying frantically to get them to go, listen, it, we won't be able to do the tour. It's all booked. It's the bands, I mean, mm -hmm. no, they're, they're just, in the end, I think they were getting really pissed off with us and just going, that's how it works. That's what you're doing. Yeah. We're not talking to you. So there was nothing we could do. We are going, right, we can't fucking get there. So um, the, the yeah. initial... Yeah, the initial idea was to do two halves, do the East Coast, and then in 23, come back and do the West Coast. <clears throat> because Jeff likes to do shorter runs these days, you know, because of his condition with his heart. So he doesn't want to do, you know, five weeks he, if he can do two. So I said, OK, we'll do two weeks and two weeks. Um, so all we do now is I'm trying to work out, we'll do the West Coast first and then come back and do the East Coast. Uh, early in 2023 because we mm -hmm. started booking West Coast. So we might as well just do that. We'll just reverse it a bit. But uh, it's annoying to think that a week after the tour should start, we'll have our fucking, he'll have his visa. And you just think, wow, you know, they don't yeah. want to be helpful. They didn't want to be helpful. So fucked us a bit. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. A Friday we fly to Sweden uh, and then we play Sweden on Saturday and uh, Finland on Sunday doing just the black metal album with the singles. Uh, and then we've got a couple of other uh, uh, things happening in Europe, um, which we're working out now. I haven't, uh, the logistics haven't announced. And then we'll do a European tour early in to uh, um, January, February 
uh, and then come straight to the USA and the West Coast. So, you know, you just have to keep going and do what you can do. It's just annoying that we were like so yeah. excited because this was going to be the first time we were playing the new album. Yeah. And we were starting in New York and we had all these amazing things lined up and, and <laughs> just because of red tape now we're fucked. So it's like, yeah. okay, well, yeah. it is well, what it is. So yeah. yeah. I'm here in Toronto and I hope you guys can make it to this city in the near future when you reschedule. So I'll keep my fingers crossed for sure. Yeah, well, you know, the 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 way it was working, they didn't want to put us up into Canada and back mm. into the USA. Um, so I just said, well, why don't we do because what we have never done uh um is gone from east to west in Canada. Mm. So instead of going, you know, from Detroit up to Toronto, up to Montreal, up to Ottawa, back down into New York, and then wait till we went to the other side and going up into Vancouver, down into Seattle. <clears throat> I said, why don't we go from like uh Montreal or Ottawa? Why don't we go from there all the way to Vancouver? That wow. way we get to play a Calgary. We get to put, put, put you know, an Alberta in there or, yeah. or, you know, a Manitoba or something. It's like, you know, why not? Why can't we yeah. do that, you know? So yeah. that's the idea, you know. I mean, I don't know how many bands go into Saskatchewan. So it's yeah. like, fucking hell. Why, Close why to can't nothing. we do that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, Alaska, you know, Metallica once. It's like, why don't we go to Anchorage? For it? Why not? Yeah. And they go, well, you know, even if, even if it's like, you know, because for me, If it's a thousand fans, fucking fantastic. And if it's a great big stadium show, great. If it's a big stage, great. If you can have pyros, amazing. If you can, but you know, what if there's somebody in an anchorage who, or Yellowknife, who can't, hasn't got the money to go and see a show, but you're still their favorite band. What, of you course. can't go and play a club there so they can come? Fuck that. Of yeah. course you can. Of course you Absolutely. can. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's what I want to do anyway. So yeah. that's the idea. Yeah. And last question for me with uh, two albums now under your belt, are we expecting the material from Venom to take a back seat in the set list or at least to share a little bit more? I think so. You know, it's always very difficult because, you know, when you're there, the fans want to hear it. But I yeah. think that what we're quite excited about, and I think it, it would be nice to do is to, is to put, play predominantly the new album so I can get as much of that played as possible yeah. so they can hear everything off it. And then add, obviously, some of our favorites from RV. Uh, and then for our encores, you know, put together. And, okay, if that's 10 encore songs, that is 10, <laughs> you know. But, yeah, um, but yeah keep, keep the classics that people like and want to hear. Put them at the end and maybe vary them every night. Uh, but really try and focus on on this album and of it because um you know the, the the advantage of being us is that we have so much great material you know yeah. there's so much we can play um so so much to pick from but um i think yeah we'd like to kind of play this album because we're quite excited about it you yeah. know the way we we all performed it so we want to be able to do that live to show people that you know even live it's got even more power than If you think it's powerful, when you're listening on record, when we're live, we want it to come alive for you. So yeah, yeah, excellent. I'm looking forward to that. Well, Pretty Tony, nice. thank you so much for your time and, and all the best with the new album. I love it. Ah, uh, thank you so much. That's so good to hear, and uh, I hope to see you all very soon. And to to everybody in Toronto, the, the love of my life, Canada, of course. We shall see you very soon in Ontario and beyond. So awesome. Uh, look forward to us in 2023. We'll be there. Thanks. Have a good one. Cheers. You too. Ciao, ciao. Bye. See you later.